nice to be here. Uh, my name's John McDougall. I'm a, a board certified internist. I've been uh, in the practice of medicine for over half a century, which gives me experience. Maybe I'm not young, but I've got a lot of experience. And uh, I've written 13 national best-selling books, run live-in programs, had television and radio shows, just a whole bunch of fun stuff. But I think the thing you need to know most about me is that I love being a doctor, and I'm the luckiest doctor in the world. And the reason is my patients get well. They don't get a bunch of drugs and a bunch of excuses. They get well. And what I'm going to present for you today is probably the most perplexing problem out there, and that's that everybody's too fat. And I have a paper here, a research paper that just came out that says that 91% of the people in this country are overweight. You know, when that, when that many people are overweight and sick, you've got to pretty much figure everybody's in trouble. So this is a presentation I'm giving to you and to your relatives and to your friends and your coworkers and so on. And if you understand what I'm going to say in the next, who knows, hour, hour and a half, two hours, uh, and really, really understand the concepts. I, I hope to, to set you free, to give you control over your health, because that's really what you want. And, you know, you've heard the saying, the truth will set you free. I've got another one for you. The truth is simple and easy to understand. I got one more for you. The truth don't change. The truth don't change. And that's why I've been teaching the same thing for half a century. So let's see, I started out uh, in um, Michigan. Met my wife, Mary, who has become my lifelong partner. We've been together over 52 years. And then we met uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and decided to go to the most wonderful place in the world that we could find at that time. And we considered California and Florida and Texas sunshine and water. That's what we wanted. And then we decided that what we we're going to do is pick the, the sunniest, happiest place on earth that we could figure. And that was the Hawaiian Islands. So in 1972, Mary and I uh, left the Michigan area and moved to Hawaii where our whole lives were changed. I spent a year as a uh, surgical intern. Uh, I learned a lot, I learned a lot. But one thing I really learned is I should not be a surgeon. I was terrible at being a surgeon. I, and, I, and I could have figured that out beforehand before I even took the effort. I'm the kind of guy that can't nail two boards together with a hammer and a nail. You know, my carpentry skills are basically nothing. I, I had no place being in an operating room, but I didn't want to leave Hawaii. And so this is 1973, finished my year of internship, and I was offered a job on the big island of Hawaii. And that's where I pretty much learned everything that I know today. I, I was offered a job working on a sugar plantation. Didn't know what that was, but at least I got to stay in Hawaii. And... Uh, they said, look, John, you're going to be taking care of 5,000 people, sugar plantation workers, all the way from the managers to the people who work in the fields. They're your patients. You're going to do everything for them. And we're going to pay you $17,000 a year. Wow, $17,000 a year. Anyway, I, 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 at that time in my life, I didn't have a lot of needs. And, and so I took the job. And I spent three years taking care of these 5,000 people. And it was kind of a unique population in the sense that I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation people. Let me take a minute to explain this to you. First generation people are born in their native lands, say Hawaii, or say the Philippines, China, Korea, Japan. That's where my first generation patients were born. You know, they got an idea that they wanted to start a new life, new family. And so they moved to Hawaii and took on jobs. And, you know, soon they got mail order brides and, and they had families and the children they had are called the second generation, and their children were the third and fourth and so on. Well, I was taking care of the first through the fourth generation. Every day in my office, they'd come walking in, and I got a chance to really observe them and figure out what was going on. And uh, I had a couple of experiences that I want to share with you. One is, is I didn't help very many of them. Now, I figured I wasn't a very good doctor. You know, the, my patients just wouldn't get well at least those with chronic diseases. In fact, I have to admit, I did you know, a few of them more harm than good. So, uh, you know, the reason that I wasn't getting people well is because they, they were suffering from chronic illness, chronic disease. You know, I mean, just the word chronic, I mean, figure it out. Stays the same, never gets better, right? I should have given up on obesity, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, 
uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Like, I should have just given up. It's chronic. It's never going to go away. I never saw it go away. I was doing a pretty good job with another area of my patient care, and that was when they had acute problems. Not chronic, but acute. Like, for example, they cut themselves with their machete, or they get a broken bone or an infection. Well, my skills allowed me to really make a wonderful change in their life by helping them, sewing up their wounds and lancing their abscesses and straighten out their bones. That was like about 5%, 10% of my practice, 90 95% was chronic illness. And I'll tell you, my patients would not get better. It would not get better. And I took it personally. I figured it was my fault. I didn't get a very good education back at Michigan State University, at uh, the medical school, at the Queens Medical Center, at the residency program. I didn't get a good education, I figured. I mean, after all, I had seen what real doctors do. I mean, I watched Ben Casey, Dr. Welby. Uh, ben Casey and Dr. Welby, uh, they, they, you know, they were the famous TV doctors. Dr. Kildare, was it? Marcus Welby, Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare. That, I remember my heroes. They cured everything. I was curing nothing. And I took it personally. Well, they're, they're, that's one thing they taught me. They taught me my... Uh, my limitations as a doctor, big time. But the second thing they taught me was they taught me about how people eat differently. And if they eat differently, they suffered different problems or had different advantages in life. And what I was looking at is primarily their diet. The first generation, they were raised in Japan, the Philippines, et cetera. And uh, they learned a diet of rice. 90% of their food was white rice. Few vegetables, you know, uh, maybe a little fish on rare occasions, but that was it. Rice, the first generation, and they moved to, to Hawaii, and you know, we had Texas Drive in the home of the Malasada, right up from where I lived in the plantation, and they learned. We had the first McDonald's come to Hilo, Hawaii, in 1974. I was one of their first and best customers. Second generation learned well, but, you know, they still had some ties to the first generation. But by the time you got to the third generation, they were fully westernized. In fact, I have to say the third and fourth generation, they ended up actually more overweight and more ill than the patients I had trained on back in Michigan. They enthusiastically embraced the Western diet. Anyway, three years of that, you know, deciding I was a bad doctor and had to fix that problem. And uh, still hadn't done a lot changing my diet. Changed it a little bit at that time. Anyway, after three years in 1976, I went back. Well, I went back to the John Burns School of Medicine in Honolulu, Hawaii. That's where I went. It was a great program. And I went back to learn how to be a good doctor. I had a good attitude. And I watched my mentors, you know, all these really, really good doctors from major universities all over the country. And I watched them apply their skills to similar patients to mine. And guess what? Their patients didn't do any better. So I figured out pretty quickly the problem, the problem was not mine. The problem was the system doesn't work. And it hasn't changed much in the last 50 years. It still doesn't work. People are still sick, still overweight. They're not solving their problems. So I went back into training, really made some major changes in my diet beginning in 1977. I'd have to say pretty close, close after 1977, I became what you call a pure vegan and uh, went on to an internal medicine residency program. And I became a board certified ten internist. What's that tell you? That tells you that I at least know as much as other internists know because I took the test to prove it. But, uh, you know, I wasn't really having a lot of fun. Even after my residency, I had to do general work just to put food on the table and shoes on the kids and pay tuition. I mean, I had to do just general doctor work. But uh, eventually I developed a practice in Hawaii where my, my practice came completely from people who were interested in what I was interested in. And that happened about 1986. I, I threw away my beeper. I stopped working after five o'clock and I only saw people who wanted to, who wanted to practice the kind of medicine that I practice. So, um, I set up a practice, a general practice, and stayed in that practice until, oh, let's see, about, about 1987. Yeah, I was there from 1978 to 1987. 
I was in uh, general practice. So 1986, 1987, I was contacted by the people in California from the St. Louis Hospital, where they'd run they'd run programs uh, related to diet and exercise. St. Louis Hospital was an Adventist hospital, and so they had the Seventh Day Adventist religion behind them, which encouraged vegetarian eating. If you know anything about the religion, anyway, uh, they. Uh, uh, convinced me that my professional life would go better if I moved from Hawaii to California. And so we did so in about 1987. And I ran, I ran for 16 years. I ran a, a live-in program. It was a 12-day uh, program. Sometimes it was a 10-day program. And uh, I did that up until the year 2002. And finally in 2002, I'd had it with a hospital-based system and and, and I, I left. And I'll tell you the reason someday if you're interested in why I left. But I left. I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I didn't want to be associated with the people that I was working with anymore because of what they were doing, because I knew better. Uh, so anyway, I uh, practiced at uh, St. Helena Hospital in the Napa Valley from about uh, 1987 to 2002. And then in 2002, after I left St. Helena Hospital, I set up a resort in Santa Rosa, California, a pretty nice resort it was. And we ran a 10 day program there. And uh, I saw all oh, over 3000 patients there. So 3000 at St. Helena, at least 3000 in the resort program. We stayed there for 18 years. And then we had the pandemic, you know, the COVID-19, you remember, and no transportation, no hotels, nothing. And we were closed down, we were shut down. And so what we did was we set up a telemedicine program, which was the best thing we ever done. I, I, can't, I can't tell you what a transition it's been for the staff and the patients. I've cut the cost of the program by two thirds. It's only a third of what, of what it cost you when you were traveling to California to visit me. And uh, so we cut the costs, we improved the compliance and the education, and in some ways the personal contact. So the people are now doing better at our telemedicine program, which we've run for uh, it's coming on four years now. They did better in the telemedicine program where we took care of them in their own homes. And that's part of why. That's part of why. Because, because uh, they were in their own homes and they could learn how to cook right where they were living. You know, it doesn't like they had to travel from the resort, go home, throw everything out and start over. No, we take care of them right in their home. Anyway, we're getting far better results and people are much happier with the telemedicine program. And that's where we're at today. But along the way, I've uh, developed, I've uh, educated myself in various areas of nutrition and medicine. And uh, most of those you can find on my website, most of the discussions, the things that I've learned on the website with drmcdougall.com, or you can go to YouTube. I, I must have 200 videos out there. But... Um, Anyway, if you want to get into heart disease or cancer or autoimmune diseases, you'll see how I practice medicine. We call it McDougall's medicine. We call it a challenging second opinion because it's not the way I was taught. It's a food-centered program and a lot of fun. So in my career, put everything together, internship, residency, private practice, St. Lena Hospital, the resort, and now I've, I've seen over, I've touched, I've cared for, I've talked to over 12,000 people. You know, I've earned the right to talk to you. Not only because I've had that kind of education, but also because of my personal health, I've earned, earned the right to talk to you. I was a very sick child and young man because my parents believed that the most important nutrients that I could possibly consume for their family was calcium and protein. They didn't know at that time, nobody seemed to know at that time that there was no such thing as protein or calcium deficiency. But they thought there was thanks to the dairy and the meat industry. And uh, as a result, I got fed a heavy diet of eggs and meat and cheese and so on. Well, I was constipated as a kid, I had terrible stomach cramps, lost my tonsils at seven due to all that dairy, seven years old. You know, as a teenager, I was, lethargic. And I have to say, I didn't have any endurance. I had plenty of oily skin and acne. I did for sure. 
you know, it was, it was not good. And then something happened to me that changed my life forever. And that is at age 18, I had a massive stroke. I ended up in Grace Hospital in Detroit, Michigan for two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, I assigned myself against medical, out against medical advice because I could move my thumb that much. And that's about it. Well, it changed my life in a couple of ways. One, it introduced me to the medical businesses. It introduced me to the medical profession. Uh, and it was important that that happened because we had a, a, a respect for doctors uh, that probably most of them don't deserve. We, we thought doctors were next to God. And I wasn't that quality of a person. I was a regular old person. And oh my goodness, I could never become a doctor. Well, anyway, I... Uh, I met doctors and uh, they, they weren't that impressive, I'll tell you that. I met some of the best specialists in, in the Detroit area. I was at Grace Hospital. They'd come in and see me, they'd take my history, physical examination, and they, they'd get done. You know, I was a curiosity. Only, only about a thousand teenagers a year have strokes, heart attacks. And then they, they ended the conversation after their visit. And it always ended this way. I'd ask them three questions. What's wrong with me? What are you going to do for me? And when am I going to go home? And their answer was uniformly the same. They would just shake their head. I said, heck, I can do that. So, you know, my whole life changed. I decided that I was going to become a medical doctor. I went to Michigan State University. And you heard the rest of the story. That's, that's, that's kind of how it all happened. So let's, let's get into the talk of today, which is about weight. All right. Well, we're going so far. How's it looking out there? Pretty good? Looks great. I hope so. so good. I know if it's not good, okay? I, I'm going to go through a format with you in this presentation. We're, we're going to talk about um, about what common beliefs are. You know, what, what, pretty much everybody seems to believe, and I, I think you'll agree with me that this is what I'm going to share with you on uh, the, the greenish colored slides, are what the common beliefs are. Uh, and then, then I'll give you my answer. I'll give you the data, the science, and then I'll tell you what I believe. As a matter of fact, the, the common beliefs come up on red slides. Uh, my beliefs come up on the green slides. So let's get that straight. We don't want to get confused so, uh, right here in the beginning. But this happens to be a green slide. All right. To start this presentation, I didn't know what to call it. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to call it, you know, a, a, uh, how to cure fat people or how to cure obesity or, you know, those are all kind of negative terms. People get upset when you use those terms. And whenever I'd use them, I'd get criticism from people that counted. And, and I was concerned that I didn't offend anybody. So first thing I did is I went looking for terms to describe the condition we're going to talk about. Yeah, I found various terms. I found like obese, uh, portly, uh, stout, and fattish, full, roly-poly. Hey, there's a whole list of them. You could probably add to that list. I can't find any, any description that comes away with a positive feeling that what you would call politically correct. None of those terms. That's because there aren't any. We, we all pretty much look upon this condition the similar ways we don't we don't desire it in fact we work a lifetime trying to do something about it well there are some some proper proper words and proper definitions i want to share with you uh, when you use the word fat that's an adjective when you talk about obese you're talking about fatness that equals disease and when you talk about overweight that, that suggests you have a standard which people must strive for, overweight. And those are the three official terms that, uh, that we use in the description of uh, the condition we're going to talk about. All right. First thing that people believe is that my natural traits and laziness condemn me to be an overweight. Now, yeah. you might... You might further define what I just said by making statements like, my stomach is too big for my body. It's all stretched out. I was born that way. Or no, I wasn't born that way through all my years of gorging. I've stretched out. Now it's too big. 
What are we saying to a person when we use that excuse? We're saying you are to blame. There's something wrong with you. I was just bored with fat genes. That's my problem. After all, there's a, a lot of uh, animal research that's done that uh, identifies genes that have a tendency towards gaining weight with various animals. So maybe you got fat genes. Well, again, you are to blame. There's something wrong with you. Or how about how about your emotional mental state? Uh, you have names for yourself when it comes to this situation. You're a compulsive overeater. You got an eating disorder. Maybe that's psychiatric. You are to blame. There's something wrong with you. How about exercise? You know, this is one I'm sure initially you would go for. You'd say, oh, yeah, it's my fault. I don't exercise enough. Well, you know, again, that's you're to blame. There's something wrong with you. And, of course, none of these are, are true. <sighs> the green slide, my response, what the science says. Blaming you, the patient, is wrong and not helpful. Likely you're perfectly normal. You know, I, I know lots of things have happened to you and health problems and got a lot of emotional distress and, and uh, oh, everybody could exercise more, right? Yeah, it at least makes you, makes you fit if it doesn't help you lose weight. All right, let's go on to uh, another common myth. If our only were a stronger person, I could solve my weight problems. If I, if I had some willpower, that's my problem. I'm just not strong. Well, there's a, an experiment that you might consider doing. Uh, yeah, we did it not as an experiment, but as a, as a statement. Yeah, this was uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, Mary and I belonged to a congregation in Honolulu, uh, a very friendly group of people. And at that time, they were talking about starving children in Africa. Every night on the news, you know, these, these uh, very, very distressed children. It brought us, uh, you know, a lot of sympathy. And, and my comment uh, during one of our sessions was, look, you guys are talking about starving, suffering people. Uh, why don't we all find out what it's like to be hungry so we can relate to them, have a little empathy. And uh, what I did is I got uh, half of the congregation to go along with me. And we decided, to, I, I, of course, was the instigator, decided that what we ought to do is we ought to not eat just for a weekend. You know, just a few hours, a couple of days. But 48 hours, thats that would be enough. Well, we did that. Uh, we all agreed just to drink water for the weekend. And Friday night was no big deal. I thought, Shh, this is, I'm feeling great. Saturday morning, still, everything was pretty good. And by Saturday afternoon, all I could think about was food. By Saturday evening, I had no more money problems. I wasn't worried about nuclear war. I wasn't having any spouse problems. I didn't have any problem on my mind except one. That was to do something about this hunger. It was intense. It was overwhelming. Just in 24 hours. I mean, could you go without food for 24 hours? Well, I'm going to ask you to do it for a little more than that, maybe 40 hours. So Sunday morning came along, and I could just hardly wait to get together with the group because we were going to finally eat on Sunday afternoon. And Mary fixed a meal typical of what the children would be having in Africa if they had food available. She made a green lettuce salad, a lentil stew, flatbread, and rice. I want to tell you, for, for, for those of who who participated in this experiment. That was the best meal we ever had. If you want to learn about hunger and how powerful it is, you can do it in 36 hours. All you will be thinking about is hunger, the pain of hunger. I seriously think you ought to try it if you're not sick and you're not a kid. It'd be an education that would be, would change your life. During World War II, lots of people suffered starvation, particularly Western Europe. 
Uh, this occurred through many parts of the world at different times. So it's nothing necessarily unique, but it was a it was a, a time that you know at least our parents experienced during World War II. And because of the the lack of food, people were desperate. And they would get whatever food they could find. And what they found find were found were primarily foods that we eat on the McDougal diet. Interesting. They're primarily vegetable foods, not seeds, potatoes. Well, one of the things that they're eating in Holland, which was kind of interesting, was they were living on tulip bulbs. Those are underground storage organs. Tulip bulbs. That was that was the main source of calories. Well, at that at that particular time, a fellow by the name of Ansel Keys, Ansel Keys, uh, he he developed the K rations which is the food. They still feed, feed people. They were just feed, feeding K rations uh, in a part of the world where they're having a lot of disasters right now. During World War II, it was K rations. Uh, Keys, Ansel Keys, K rations. Now, Ansel Keys did the seven country study, which is the foundation for us believing that animal foods are the source of many of our illnesses, in particular heart disease. Ansel Keys did that. Ansel Keys, of course, is a very famous man, and he took his talents, and what he decided to do was to set up an experiment called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. And they took over some uh, some community grounds, fairgrounds, and and he set up this experiment to to learn about hunger, to find out what it was what it was about, so that we could better deal with it. At that particular time, World War II. And in the future, Ansel Keys decided to do that. So he was able to get 36 conscientious objectors, 36 young men who didn't want to kill, but they wanted to serve their country. And so they volunteered for this experiment. It was an 11-month experiment where they changed the amount of food that they were allowed to consume. It was called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. 11 months. Uh, the intention was men to lose 25% of their normal body weight. Now, you know, pay attention to this carefully because there's some figures here I'd like you to try and remember. The first three months, they fed them what typically these men would be eating as far as calories are concerned, about 3,200 calories a day. Then they cut their food intake in half. And now for the next six, and for the next six months, they had to, eat half the calories. They were under a condition of semi-starvation. They were taking in 1,570 calories a day for six months. And then they had two months of refeeding. Uh, most of the men were put back uh, on food slowly, but there was a small group of 12 that were told, you can eat whatever you want, eat as much as you want. All right, so we have starting out with 3,200 calories, cutting those calories in half during this period of semi-starvation that lasts for six months, and then a refeeding period. Now, I want you to note that the star semi-starvation period, they weren't starving. They weren't in a condition called ketosis, where your appetite is suppressed. They were just semi-starving, where, where you have the pain of hunger. All they thought about was food. They read cookbooks. They read stories about food. They dreamed about food. They had daydreams about food. They watched movies about food. They read cookbooks, recipes. All they could think about was food. You know, they guarded their food with their elbows. They wouldn't let anybody get close to whatever they had on their plate. They would lick their plates to get the last crumb of food. There were some people in the, in the lunchroom that weren't uh, eating like they were. And these people who were non-participants, they got really upset with them, especially when they saw them wasting food. This went on for six months, half the calories. It, it was so severe, they, they lost their interest in sex. They were no longer interested in women. Uh, they developed anxiety and depression. They got stomach problems like headaches and trouble sleeping. You can see the physical changes, you know, profound loss of weight. One, one person lost 50 pounds. They uh, chew gum. 
they would stick three so three sticks of gum gum in their mouth and they would chew rapidly just because it was that mechanical sensation would give them some type of of uh, satisfaction, not nearly comparable to satisfying hunger. They rummaged through garbage cans looking for food. They played with their food. Increased the amount of spices and salt. It was a tough time, to say the least, for these men. Six months semi-starvation. Now, most of the men, all except for 12, so that would be, what, 24, uh, they were carefully refed, slowly refed. But they took 12 of these men and they said, look, go out and eat whatever you want. Eat as much as you want. No restrictions. And they did something called the overshoot phenomena. They ended up gaining more weight than they originally started at. And this happens in typical starvation populations is when food is reintroduced to the population, they eat to the point where they almost kill themselves. Can't stop. Anyway, they gained 10% more of their weight than they started with. But even, even though they replenished the fat, that didn't, that didn't stop the overshooting effect. They had to replace the tissue of the, of the liver and the spleen and the muscles, which we call non-fatty tissue, before, before they returned back to their normal weights. So the, the hope you learn from your weekend that you're going to experiment with of not having any food, and you'll learn from the conscientious objectors under the direction of Ansel Keys, the fact that the hunger drive is intense. You can't deny it. If you would, you would likely be busy doing something else and forget to eat and not bother and you would starve to death. It has to be that intense. It's one of the three basic drives that keeps us alive. Myth, common myth. Suppressing my hunger drive with diets and drugs is my best hope. Diets and drugs. I mean, that's what you've tried in the past or your friends or relatives, diet and drugs. The, the diets that they have been popular for so long. Well, the, the first diet that's been popular for so long is the starve yourself diet. And th that's the semi-starvation that we just talked about. That's called portion control. That's called heavy will willpower and, and limiting the amount of your food, food you eat. Uh, these are people that would eat paint off the refrigerator. They're so hungry. And that's dieting. But short of dieting, the way that diets take care of that powerful hunger drive is you go on a low carb diet. Keto diets, they call them these days. They used to call them the Atkins diet. Uh, some people call it the carnivore diet. I've heard doctors say that you should eat an animal from its nose to its tail and everything in between. Anyway, they're all low carb diets. They, they take the carbohydrate out, not just sugar, but potatoes and rice and corn. And you're left with fat and protein. Low carb diet. The body loves carbohydrate. Your basic metabolism is called glycolysis. That's burning sugar, glucose. The uh, low-carb diets popularized uh, oh, 150 years ago, but Atkins popularized low-carb diet about 50 years ago. Bacon, butter, and brie. That's what he asked you to eat, bacon, butter, and brie. And uh, what happens is the body, because it doesn't have any sugar to burn, no glycogen, which is stored in the muscles and liver, you're not eating any carbohydrate. The body has to resort to something to stay alive. And so what it resorts to is burning fat, body fat and food fat, the fat that you eat, the butter and the brie. When you burn fat, you release a product of fat metabolism called ketones. And you go into a condition called ketosis. If you run into somebody like this, you'll, you'll smell their breath. It, it smells like acetone. Ketosis suppresses the hunger drive. That's what it does. And it does for, for some very important, natural, desirable reasons. 
you naturally go into ketosis during times of prolonged starvation. So the only the th first three, four, five days, you know, like that weekend we're talking about, are you in such horrible pain? And then what happens is your metabolism changes. You develop these ketone bodies in you, in your bloodstream throughout your tissues, and the hunger drive is depressed. This happens when you get sick. Why? Because it's okay to be in pain the first two or three days, but after that, you got to figure out how to get out of trouble. And if you happen to be starving to death, you have to figure out how to solve the starvation problem. You'll survive, on average, 60 days if there's no food available. So during that, after the first two or three days of only thinking about food, you start thinking about ways to get yourself out of trouble for, for the next 55 days not bothered so much by the pain of hunger. You're in ketosis. And when it comes to sickness, when you're sick, you're supposed to be recuperating. You're not supposed to be gathering and preparing food. So that naturally occurs too. So what I call these ketose diets are the make yourself sick diets, because that's the way they work. They make you sick. Not just short term, like we talked about, but also long term, which we're going to talk about. They're really popular because keto diets, these carnivore diets, what they do first is they cause the body to burn the sugar that's in the body. It's in the form of glycogen. You store two pounds of glycogen in your liver and muscles. That two pounds is associated with, well, each pound is associated with two pounds of water. So two pounds has four pounds of water associated with it. So when you lose the glycogen, which you're going to burn off in the first couple of days, You've lost two pounds of glycogen and four pounds of water. You go, my goodness, Nirvana, I've discovered the best diet ever. I just lost six, eight, 10 pounds of water. That's what you lost. And then you go into the state of sickness and you may lose more weight, but not for long. Even Robert Atkins couldn't stay with his own diet. Yeah, about that time, these uh, Atkins people, these low carbers, uh, they started writing articles. They still do. They haven't stopped. They'll, they'll tell you everything is cured with a keto diet or a low carb diet. It's, it's just plain and simple. Not true. I don't know where they get their imagination. Oh, I know where they get their imagination. Actually, I wrote a story about their imagination back in 2004. Uh, some low carb diet doctors, they wrote an article in Mayo Clinic Proceedings about how not only did this low carb diet cause you to lose weight, but it helped you become healthier. And why they knew it helped you become healthier is because the blood pressures were lowered. The cholesterol came down. The blood sugar came down. Oh boy, these are all things that we use to determine health. Uh, we do. These are called risk factors. And these numbers all improve. Well, I wrote an article to my colleagues and I said, look, you can get the same results that you're getting with these low carb diets. You can get, get the same results with cancer chemotherapy. You, you give a person cancer chemotherapy, not only do they lose their hair, but they throw up for a year and they lose weight and their cholesterol comes down and their blood pressure comes down and their blood sugar comes down. But what doctor would brag about his or her patients losing weight, taking chemotherapy? Make yourself sick. Long term, make yourself sick. Uh, there, these are uh, collections of studies. They're uh, they're uh, reviews where doctors got together with a bunch of decent studies. They're called meta analyses, and they wrote papers about several studies. What I have here for you is I have all the studies that have been published, reviews of them, on low-carb diets and their effects on health. They're there for you. They're, the references are there. You can look them up. Four major studies say that if you follow this kind of eating pattern, you'll increase your risk of dying, your risk of having a heart disease, and dying of heart disease. There are no studies that say a high-carbohydrate diet causes anything similar. You will find you will find these, these review papers easy to read, worth your while. But that, that was uh, you know a few years back that these were published, so 2010, 2013, 2014. 
And then, and then came out a study of middle-aged and older people, just, just this year, or within a year. They studied people in middle age and older. A lot of them, like 371,000 of them. And they came to the conclusion that if you eat these low carb diets, you increase your risk of dying by 18%. You increase your, dying, your risk of dying of heart disease by 16%. And you increase your risk of cancer by 18%. Uh, the studies aren't going to st start showing anything different. These 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 diets will make you sick and they'll kill you. Don't follow them. There are a whole bunch of drugs for weight loss. Most of them have been complete failures, and that's why you don't hear much about them. You know, like uh, Fenfen. You heard about Fenfen. They had to take it off the market because of heart disease. And you may remember Orlistat. Orlistat's the one where you got greasy farts. You know, you had leak leakage, anal, anal leakage. That wasn't so, such a popular one, was it? But it's still prescribed, yeah. And then there's some some uh, anti-opioid-type drugs that are prescribed. In, the, in other words, the pleasure related to opioids are is eliminated with these kinds of drugs or muted. But but they aren't the popular ones these days. We've got a whole class of drugs that people are just head over heels over. That's all, all they seem to be able to talk about. And these are your GLP-1 agonists. GLP, glucagon, like glucagon protein antagonists, GLP-1. How did they develop these? They developed them by discovering the poison of a Gila monster, which is a reptile that lives in Southwest United States. That's the only place this little monster lives. And he has, in his lower jaw, he produces a venom that when he bites a person or another animal, uh, they, they suffer intense pain, nausea, vomiting, stomach distress. They really get into trouble, but it only lasts a couple of minutes. It doesn't kill. I mean, one person died, I think, of the whole study of these Gila monsters. And by the way, the poison is as serious a poison as you would get from a rattlesnake. So uh, researchers discovered these effects and that they made you lose your appetite, develop nausea and vomiting. It only lasted a couple of minutes. That wasn't so good. So they took this Gila monster poison back to the lab and they figured out how to make it last longer, you know, so that you could maybe get by with a shot or two a day. Or now you can get by with a shot a week, an injection a week. So GLP-1 agonists, uh, their desired effects. This is what they hope and expect to get by giving these drugs. Nausea, diarrhea, decreased appetite, vomiting, constipation, indigestion, uh, stomach pains. Those are the desired effects, which are very similar to what you get when you get bit by a Gila monster. And then there are some more undesirable effects, which they list. And fortunately, they're not all that common, these undesirable effects. Uh, GLP-1 agonists. But, but, but doctors, researchers, scientists will tell you, they won't tell you that the main thing uh, related to these drugs is the nausea and vomiting. That's why they work, they make you sick. What they'll do is they'll use uh, uh, adjective statements uh, such as uh, the reason our, our, our uh, particular drug works so well is it slows gastric emptying. That means the, gast the whole gastrointestinal tract slows down all the way from the stomach to the small intestine to the large intestine. It slows down, it's inhibited in its activity. So that's one of the excuses. The other is they say, well, we changed some hormones related to appetite, like ghrelin and leptin. That's what we do. And, and somehow the consumer is supposed to say this is really top-notch science, eyebrow science, and decide that they really have something good, I guess. Uh, Christian, Christian Gale, I just bring this out as an example. Uh, she's a radiologist in Honolulu. She was on Wegovi in the summer of 2022. 
uh, talk to your husband. She said, um, the drug left her repulsed by most food and vomiting nearly daily. I told my husband at one point, I'd rather starve than feel this way. I wanted to enjoy food again. Now, what they talk about is food noise. Food noise. Well, I call this the pleasure of food. I call this an appetite that I look forward to to, uh, to satisfying, but, but they call it food noise. Now, I put in the chat for you a chart of the comparison of GLP-1, uh, glucon, glucon, glucagon-like peptide-1 agonist, compared to the McDougal diet. I've got two pages listed so far that talk to you about the effects of this diet compared to what you can accomplish by following a healthy diet. And I put my name on it. But what we're talking about is a, is a high carbohydrate, low fat, probably vegan diet, which is what we prescribe. But I want you to look over this chart and I want you to see some of the things that are pointed out uh, about the difference in what you get with these two approaches. The first you'll notice up on, on top, the weight loss. The weight loss is very similar. You know, our, our program, the average weight loss is uh, uh, 23 pounds in, in a year. The average weight loss on these GLP-1s is 25 pounds. But see, they started with heavier people. Their, their, their uh, subjects were like 233 pounds. Ours were like 180 pounds. So I'll give them a few extra pounds just because they started with fatter people. So similar weight losses. And then you start looking at this other comparisons, like the cost. What's the cost to follow this kind of diet that I recommend? No, you cut your food bill by 20 to 80%. What's it cost you when you follow these, this approach? Uh, well, just in drugs, $1,000 to $1,400 a month. Here's a, a representation. This is actual chart. Uh, graph uh, from one of the studies on the effects of uh, semaglutides, GLP-1 agonists. And uh, what we're going to look at here in some detail is what happens when you follow these drugs. You'll look at the light gray line there and you'll see this is the placebo. Uh, this is the control group. This is a group of people they ask to cut their food back 500 calories and to exercise. So as a consequence of doing that, they lost a couple of pounds. And then you see the heavy black line where the people were put on these GLP-1 agonists. And you see they lose, they lose a lot of weight. They do it in percent of body loss, body fat loss. You know, they'll lose uh, 12, 14, 16, 18%. Maybe even bragging about 20% of their body weight lost. Well, if you add this up, what it turns out is it's... Uh, uh, it's about a 37 pound weight loss. And it takes 68 weeks to accomplish that. Now I want you to look out 68 weeks. You see they're losing weight for 68 weeks. And then they hit a point where the body says, hey, you can't lose any more weight. Or he'll, he'll get sick and in big trouble. So you hit a plateau. This plateau stays, it's permanent for the rest of your experience. You're at a plateau, you've lost 37 pounds, you've spent $17,000 losing that weight. It's taken you a year and a quarter to lose it. And you're done. You'll, you'll maintain that weight. You'll maintain that 37, 37 pound weight loss if you keep taking the drugs, just like prescribed. But once you stop the drugs, you're gonna regain the weight. Plan on it. Anyway, that chart I gave you compares the effects that you see here with the effects of following a healthy diet. Now, you know, I, I mentioned the way this works is it cuts down on food noise, right? Well, I call this uh, my appetite, my, my pleasurable appetite. It's something I desire. I like to enjoy my food. But if you're going to make yourself sick and cut out food noise, what else do you make sick? What else, do you, what else do you accomplish in terms of things you enjoy that may be muted and you may not enjoy them as much, like you're interested in fine wines in other people, like sex, for example. Your interest in sex is markedly decreased. Your muscle mass is decreased. It, it puts a cast over your whole life, these drugs do. 
spend some time with that chart. And it ends up, the chart ends up uh, telling you a couple of things that are never addressed, but really should be. And that is which diet is animal cruel? And which diet is kind to animals? And which diet is planet destructive? And which diet strives to save planet Earth? I'm up to two pages now. I bet you talk to me in a, in a few months, I'll have three pages of comparisons for you. All right, so uh, low-carb diets and GLP-1 agonists, uh, they make you sick, sufficiently sick, so you lose weight. But I tell you, you look at uh, a lot of the movie stars out there, and Oprah's one of them that's been identified, and I have my suspects about certain politicians that are on these. Seem to be losing some weight these days. Uh, they don't look so good. <laughs> All right, so I've told you two ways to mute the appetite. Go on a low-carb diet, make yourself sick, you develop ketosis, you don't eat. Carnivore diet, keto diet, whatever you want to call it. Or you can take drugs that are highly effective. But look at what you have to pay to gain so little. 37 pounds, 68 weeks, $17,000 of being sick. And you're sick, you know. At least half the people complain about being ill on these kind of diets, but that's the ones that complain. What about the other half that it hasn't reached a level where they they want to complain to the investigators? Eh, they don't just feel right. They don't know exactly what it is, but yeah, they're sick too. That's how the diet works. Or excuse me, the drug works. Makes people sick. All right, so we're, we've taken care of the hunger. You may say, well, that's really good. How about other ways to lose weight that are popular? And do they take away hunger like the diet and drugs do? Let's talk about bariatric surgery. Uh, most people believe bariatric surgery, which is surgery for weight loss, is a permanent safe solution for obesity. I can finally stop the battle of the bulge. I don't longer have to be, feel guilty because... My willpower will will lose to the surgical malarrangement that the doctors caused in my intestinal tract. The serious malabsorption that the doctors caused by operating on my intestinal tract. Willpower is still there. Hunger is still there. So we have all these uh, these bariatric surgeries, and they work. You lose weight, and besides that, you have some other benefits. I want to acknowledge you. Uh, Recu reduces your risk of dying, reduces your risk of heart attacks. Cures, di cures diabetes. Let me tell you, the, you know, the cure rate for diabetes is close to 80%. From the surgery, close to 80%. Anyway, you do lose some weight, uh, but uh, they have to rearrange certain parts of your intestinal tract. Like, for example, one way that it's accomplished is... Um, a small hole is made in your abdomen, and, and uh, this particular band is put around part of your stomach. This is an inflatable band. And so if you complain to the doctor about not losing enough fast enough, the doctor will just pumps more fluid in it, make the stomach even smaller, and you lose more weight. Of course, you suffer more, too. Anyway, that's a, a common approach is the lap band. And the other approach is to take away like about 80% of your stomach. It's gone. Boom, thrown in the trash. Not coming back either. Uh, this is a sleeve sleeve approach, gastric sleeve. And then we have uh, the most dramatic of all surgeries, bariatric surgeries, and that's uh, an intestinal bypass, where they take and they route the food away from the part of the intestine that absorbs calories and everything else, vitamins, minerals, everything. That's the small intestine. So uh, what happens is right after the stomach, you know, they leave a little bit of small intestine and then they isolate the other 25 feet of small intestine out of the flow of food and they reconnect this esophagus to the, the last part of the small intestine. So you bypass absorption. Yeah. And people run into all kinds of nutritional problems. And one of the things that I have people who come to see me worry about is you know, because of the smell absorption, yeah, they lost weight, but, you know, they have vitamin deficiencies and 
you know, fatty acid deficiencies and all kinds of things. And their doctors put them on massive doses of uh, supplements. And they say, well, you know, you don't like doc people to take supplements, do you, Dr. McDougall? I say, no, for very good reasons. Well, what am I going to do? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to be on the most nutrient-dense diet that there is. And that's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. More nutrients than any other diet you can possibly design. However, there are two nutrients which there's no such deficiency of, which is protein and calcium, where we started this conversation. Those two, those two nutrients are not a problem here either. Such a thing as calcium and protein deficiency, but that's all we learned. We don't have to worry about that on, on the McDougal diet, not at all. Not having animal foods in it. But the vitamins and minerals and so on, you're eating a diet if you follow our plan that has more vitamins, minerals, plenty of essential fat, all the protein, amino acids you'd ever need, et cetera. You don't need to take supplements. Uh, let's talk about Al Roker. I think he's a good example. He's public. You know, he brags about his physique and his weight loss and his steps. Yeah, he's a, he's a NBC's weather reporter. He gets a lot of time on air. You, you can run across him. Uh, Al Roker, in 2002, he underwent uh, gastric bypass surgery. Lost um, 100 pounds. Went from 320 to 220. And he was so proud. I can see him there holding his pants up. And uh, then he regained the weight. In September of 2018, he went on a keto diet. And you see, he got good results, lost 40 pounds. Tune into the TV tonight. And you'll see an old Roker who either needs the GLP-1 agonists, you know, the semi-glutides, the Ozempic, the Wegovy, the Zepbound, you know, the drugs that are, he needs those. And maybe he's taking them, I don't know. Or he needs to go on the McDougal diet. That's what he needs to do. Stop this nonsense. It's gotten to the point where the American Academy of Pediatrics has given permission for the medical business uh, to offer these therapies to children. Children who are obese, but children. You know, they say as of age 12, you can start giving them the GLP-1 agonists. At age 13, you can start operating on their intestines. Well, they say that because they absolutely know that there's no other way to handle the problem. A statement you know, from Aaron Kelly, co-director of the Center for Pediatric Obesity. He says obesity is not a lifestyle problem. It's not a lifestyle disease. It predominantly emerges from biologic factors. Maybe your stomach is too big. Maybe your genes. Maybe you have psychological problems. You're to blame. That's what you're being told. And don't even think about changing your diet because it's not going to make any difference. That's what you're told. Guaranteeing financial success of both the drug companies and the surgery business for a long time. All right, so weight loss, bariatric surgery. Uh, uh, you lose weight very painfully, very expensively. But one of the things I want you to reflect on is is these people are still hungry. They just can't eat. And so they do all kinds of things. They eat many times a day. They grind up their food. They do all kinds of maneuvers to get the food in because they're still ravenously hungry. And you can't beat that hunger drive. You're going to try it for the weekend, aren't you? I hope so. All right. So I'm doomed to be fat and in poor health, people say. Unless I take the drugs or the surgeries, that's what they say. And as I say, you know, 91% of people, I can show you the research, 91% of people are over fat for their health. But those people, how about other animals? Do you find any of them obese or too fat or? No, none of them. Hippopotamuses, giraffes, Gorillas, they all seem to be pretty much with the size they ought to be, shouldn't aren't they? Yeah. As long as they have enough food of their natural diet, they're just fine. How come, how come it isn't that way with people? How come how we have such, such difficulty? How come we were designed so poorly? I don't believe we were designed poorly. 
I believe we were as well designed as other animals. It's just we must be doing something terribly wrong in mass, terribly wrong. And that's what we do to our animals. Sometimes when we bring them into our household, you've seen this. You've seen the pudgy cat or the pudgy dog because you're feeding them table scraps. Sure, you can make your animals sick and overweight. Just feed them a diet that's not intended for them. Just like, you know, near billions of people. We've known this for thousands of years. What the problem is? The problem is eating rich food all the time, not just on special occasions, but all the time. And typically the aristocrats, the kings and queens, the pharaohs, the priests, uh, their picture is being sick and overweight. Whereas the common person who ate uh, the starches, you know, they, they lived on the, the corn and the wheat and beans and the potatoes. And they toiled the fields and they built the pyramids eating these foods. But that wasn't okay for the, the higher class. You know, what they did is they took these common starches and they fed them to pigs and sheep and cows, pheasants. And then they ate those animals. And they got fat and sick. Yes, they did. And so they do still today. But today, today, king and queen food is just right around the corner. We have Dairy Queen, Burger King, Imperial Margarine. Yeah. Or, or we have... The, the most you can get for the least amount of money, food outlets. That's what they do. That's what, you know, industry is just responding to what you're asking for. You're asking for as much food as you can get for as few few dollars as you can spend. Maybe not you particularly, but you know, the general population. And so uh, industry, the food industry is going to respond to your demands. They're in business. And so they'll do things like dump the leftover cheese in the pancakes and make a meal of a stack of pancakes that's 1,360 calories, 42 grams of fat, 36% fat. That is one, one, one meal. Uh, a typical woman, active woman, maybe 15, 1,700 calories a day. A man, 2,000, 2,200 calories a day. But mild activity. But look, you, you took in, uh, you know, half to two thirds of your calorie and taken one meal. A Taco Bell, Chula, cra Cravings Box, uh, 1,500 calories, 47% fat. Pizza Hut, you know, but I used to eat pizza. I still do, by the way, without cheese. But I used to eat pizza. I wouldn't eat just one slice, no. I think four slices of pizza is pretty, pretty common serving. And that's 1,240 calories. And then we have McDonald's coming out with their classic burger. And it's called the Land, Sea, and Air Burger. Guess what it has in it? You know, for land, it has a little cow. And for sea, it has a little fish. And, and you know what they, 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 they're, they're serving in the layer of air, right? Yeah. Anyway, 1,330 calories. You, you can't get away from this stuff unless you make an effort and you get some education and somebody tells you the truth. But that doesn't happen with most people. All right. So let's go on to another common myth. Starches leave me hungry. I must eat meat to be full. This is a, a kind of a, a, a thing I've noticed happening with people when they first change their diet. They say, I'm not hungry, doc, or I'm not, I'm not satisfied, doc. And, and I can relate to that. I, I can relate to that because when I used to go to Chinese restaurants, when I was a you know, heavy American diet eater, I never felt full because I was fed rice and vegetables. There was something missing that 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 pound of flesh and that glob of fat wasn't there in my stomach that it was used to. Well, I can tell you, you know, when you change your diet, uh, your response changes too, and you'll find that you don't get satisfied anymore on these animal foods. You get your satisfaction from where satisfaction ought to come from, which is starch, which is what I'm going to talk to you about now. I'm talking about what nutrient satisfies the hunger drive. What you should be looking for to answer that wonderful drive of hunger. Various studies have done. You can look at these in detail. I've given you the references. And I, I hope you will take the trouble to look this stuff up. You know, various ways of researching what, 
what satisfies the hunger in food. There are three macronutrients. There's protein, fat, and carbohydrate. So that's what the intestine, these give calories, each in its own way. And so uh, what they will do is feed subjects various kinds of meals. Now I ask them, how do you feel? Uh, what, what, what's your satiety index? And uh, what they find is that when you eat low fat meals, you take in fewer calories. Yeah, uh, 2158 calories on low fat, needing fat 2440. They didn't, all they ask them is how satisfied you are when you're done eating. High fat diet is 2554. That's one way they do the research. Another way is they will take uh, subjects and feed them various breakfasts in the beginning of the study, in the morning. You know, they, they, they'd feed them a, a high carbohydrate breakfast, a high fat breakfast, or a normal breakfast. And uh, they would ask them later on, how do you feel, you know, after eating these different breakfasts? And uh, they would come back and tell them that they were still hungry. And as a result, they took in more food or more calories on a high fat diet to satisfy their hunger drive. Or in this particular kind of research, what they do is they uh, feed meals, again, it's breakfasts, and they feed different, uh, different uh, design breakfasts, different components, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. And when they fed uh, a normal breakfast, and they offered them sandwiches to eat to complete the satisfaction of the hunger drive. And they count the number of sandwiches that they, they ate. What they found, they call them snacks. What they, what they found is when you eat a normal meal for breakfast, that you took in a few snacks. Yeah, you did. And when you ate a high fat meal, you took in uh, more snacks. Yeah, more of these sandwiches. And then a high carb meal, you took in fewer sandwiches. They just counted the sandwiches. Pretty objective, huh? Or, or, or I like this one. I probably like this one the best. This was done by, done by uh, a listener. Uh, Dr. Listener took uh, some people and housed them in a metabolic ward where they had complete control over their food, everything they ate. And what they did is they fixed meals where they could disguise the amount of fat in a meal. So they made things like soups and stews and muffins and breads and sandwiches and desserts where the person couldn't tell how much fat was in the, the meal. And then what they did is they would add uh, certain amounts of fat at, at different times. And they would see how much people consumed, how many calories. And uh, they were completely uh, unaware of whether it was a high fat or low fat bread or muffin or soup. They didn't have any idea. They just told them to eat until you're satisfied, your hunger drive. And, and by making this kind of recommendation, look what they found. When you ate a, uh, a meal plan that was 40 to 50% fat, you took in 2,700 calories because fat is so high in calories. When, when you took in 30 to 35% fat in your breads and muffins, you only took in 2,400 calories, 300 less spontaneously, not even aware of it. You just took in fewer calories just by varying the fat content. And then they brought it down to 15 to 20% fat. And you see, they reduced their intake of calories by 600 calories without even being aware of it. In other words, it didn't suffer a bit. When you increase the fat, you decrease the carbohydrate. And we're going to talk about the varying, varying properties of satisfaction of fat, protein, and carbohydrate in our next session. One of your uh, big clues might be your tongue. You know, this is where you first contact food. You learned in high school, maybe, maybe junior high, uh, the biology of the tongue. And you learned about four tastes they're the taste for salt, the taste for sweetness, simple sugars, which are on the tip of the tongue, which tells me that you are a seeker of salt and sugar. You desire these things. It feels good when you eat salt and sugar. You love these salt flavors. And then there were two taste buds on the back of the tongue that prevented you from poisoning yourself. They're bitter and sour. 
when you took in uh, something, a plant food that was say medicinal or, or poisonous, these taste buds became active and you spit it out. So those are the four classic taste buds. And um, since that time, they've discovered three others. One is a, fat, a, a taste bud for fat, but this one works the other way. If you could taste fat, you don't eat it. Okay. Uh, those that don't have a lot of fat tasting taste buds, they, they eat it, the fat. They don't notice it. So that was one of the taste buds that was discovered. The other one was, was for umami, which is actually a taste for MSG. You know, some people will tell you it's a taste for meat. It's not. It's for monosodium glutamate. And then the last taste bud, the last taste bud discovered was discovered at Oregon, uh, or Oregon State University, you know. The researchers there, uh, published in chemo senses and eight years ago, what they did is they took subjects and they blocked the sweet tasting taste buds, the ones that tasted sugar. And then they fed them various foods. And what they discovered was a starch tasting taste bud, an independent taste bud that was just as powerful as the sweet tasting taste bud, which tasted bread and rice and potatoes and so on. We are starch eaters in part because we have a tongue designed with taste buds for us to go out and eat starch. All right, so starch is the truth is. This is what science says, and I hope you take the trouble to look up the science. I provided it for you in the right-hand corner of every slide. The truth is, is carbohydrate is satisfying to the hunger drive. Carbohydrate is your body's preferred fuel. It's glycolysis. glycolysis. All right, uh, the, the, the myth out there is starches make me fat. I must avoid potatoes, rice, and bread. Don't eat rice, turns to sugar, makes you fat. And that's why there are so many fat Asians. Wait, wait a minute here. Yeah, it's completely nonsense, isn't it? A little demo I've enjoyed giving for the last 40 years to, to various audiences. And let me share it with you. It involves uh, beakers that are the size of your stomach. And what we're going to do is put 500 calories of food in each one of the stomachs and, and see what happens. The first thing that happens when you fill up the stomach is you uh, you cause a bulk effect, a filling effect. But, you know, if that's all there is, just filling, like, for example, you take fiber pills, that sensation of fullness is very fleeting. So let's take a look at how much uh, various foods, 500 calories of various foods fills the stomach. If we start on the left, we start with oils, like corn oil, safflower oil, flaxseed oil, butters, margarines, so salad dressings. They're nine calories per gram. They just fill up just kind of a puddle in the body and the stomach. It's just a little, a little area of right there at the bottom. Hardly anything. Go on to cheese. Cheese is four calories per gram. You fill about a third of the stomach. Meat, four calories per gram, about a third of the stomach. You're, you're still not satisfied. You're still hungry. How about rice? Almost fills the stomach. One calorie per gram. Corn, one calorie per gram. Potatoes, six tenths. I couldn't even get all the potatoes in that beaker. Six tenths of a calorie per gram. That has to do with calorie density. If we eat calorie dense foods, we take in a lot more calories until we're full. If we take in calorie dilute foods, they're very filling. We take in fewer calories. But as I said, you know, if it's just filling, it doesn't last long. You must have some more central effect. Uh, those hormones, those lectins and, and gar garlands that, that I talked to you about in the previous slides, these, these uh, blood sugar and insulin levels, they, these all have to change to really give you central satisfaction. And what satisfies the hunger drive is carbohydrate. I, I just shared this with you. And let's take a look at the carbohydrate content of these various beakers. No carbohydrate in oil, butter, margarine, virtually none in cheese, 2% of the calories in cheese, meat, 
chicken, fish, lobster, zero carbohydrate. Whereas rice, corn, and potatoes are loaded with carbohydrate. The percent of carbohydrate is like almost 90%. It's carbohydrate of these various foods. Carbohydrate that satisfies the hunger drive. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't go on to one other aspect of the food, which is really important for you. And that, that has to do with the fat. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. So uh, the percent of calories that are fat are just the opposite of the percent of calories that are carbohydrate. You know, butter is 100% fat, cheese 70, meat 60, rice 5%, eight, corn 8%, potatoes 1% fat. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. When you take in high carbohydrate food choices, you take in less fat and just the opposite is like a teeter-totter. Uh, by the way, uh, the, the percent of fat in the McDougall diet is around 7%. I showed you the experiment by listener where they used a 15 to 20% uh, fat installation into their hidden foods. That was 15 to 20%. The McDougall diet is 7% fat. So you would expect these results, these changes, and then some by following the diet I recommend. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Now, here's where you really want to look up the studies because they're important. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. From my lips to my hips, that's the saying. You know, fat moves effortlessly. It moves from your fork and spoon to your buttocks, thigh, or abdomen. It moves so effortlessly that the body doesn't even change the chemical structure of the fat. So I can tell what you like to eat based upon biopsying your body fat. I can go in there with a needle, suck up some body fat. I can take it back to the laboratory. I can analyze it. This was done in 1960. You know, we're looking at, what, 64 years ago. You know, they found corn fat in the biopsies when people ate a high corn fat diet. It was in their buttocks, thigh, abdomen, et cetera. Well, here are... Um, Six other studies, these are all of them, folks, showing you the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Look them up. One of the things that you hear, and I started out this section telling you, you know, don't eat rice, turns to sugar, makes you fat. That's why they're, that's not true. There are no fat Asians You're living on rice-based diets. Well, an important experiment was done about the body's ability to convert carbohydrate into fat. The process is called de novo lipogenesis. De novo, you know, the making of new lipogenesis fat. Okay, so can you convert sugar into fat? Not very well. Human beings are very inefficient in making this conversion. Cows and pigs, they do a pretty good job. They eat grasses and grains, and they make a pretty sizable conversion, but not, not people. Here's an experiment done. Uh, tremor obese women, what they did is they overfed them 50% of their total calories, and they had them eat three and a half ounces of table sugar, 135 grams of table sugar. This was every day they had to eat this. 50% more calories than they were used to. A whole bunch of sugar, white sugar. And uh, what happened was they produced less than four grams of fat daily, which meant that it took them four months to gain an extra pound of fat. Very inefficient. So next time somebody tells you that don't eat rice or don't eat sugar, it turns to fat, you tell them that's, a, that's not what the science says. Uh, weight loss on our program, uh, we have data at one week and also one year. In our three studies, uncontested, uh, one a randomized control trial, uh, the other observational trials. Uh, one was done by me. That was the first study of 1,700 people. It showed that we lost an average of uh, 3.1 pounds in seven days. This is 1,700 people we studied. 1,700 people. We didn't leave anybody out. The average loss was 3.1 pounds in seven days. They ate as much as they wanted. They loved the food. The, the next study was done at Oregon Health and Science University, the medical school in Portland. It was a one-year study. 
all I had to do with this study was to teach the people. It was, the study was done by the neurology department at Oregon, uh, Oregon Health and Science University, medical school in Portland. They did it. I didn't have anything to do with it. And at uh, the end of a year, except for the education, I did teach them what to do. At the end of a year, uh, the average weight loss was nearly 20 pounds. And then there was a study done totally independent of us. It was done in New Zealand. I didn't even know it was done until afterwards. When I read the paper, I saw that they used the McDougal diet. 25 pound weight loss. Eat as much as you want, as often as you want, of the right foods, foods that people love. In our uh, Oregon Health and Science University study here in, in Portland, uh, we found some interesting things about appetite. And this was one of the most exciting findings is when we presented the results of our food frequency questionnaire. In other words, how, how much did people eat? And, and what you see here is the control group, which is the red dots up there. These people were asked to stay on their typical diet, the Western diet for a year. And then another group of people, the intervention group, they came down to our clinic in Santa Rosa, California, where we kept them for 10 days and we taught them the program. And you can see what happened to their fat intake. It went from nearly 40% down to nearly 12% fat, their intake, overnight, when they learned the program. And they maintained this low fat intake for a year. You know, once you do something for six months, it's permanent. Why did, again, why did they do this? It's because they loved the food and they loved the results. It wasn't just the weight loss. There's all kinds of other wonderful things that happened to them. Anyway, you see the, the red line dropping down there at the end of the study? That's because there's a reward for being in the control group, which I feel guilty about. They had to eat a poisonous diet for a year. But we brought them down to the clinic and taught them the diet. One of the biggest concerns people have is uh, the starch bread. Don't eat bread. Oh, maybe rice is worse, but no, I think bread's worse. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say more people are afraid of bread than anything else. Well, you know, bread is a little more calorie dense than, say, wheat berries, which is where flour comes from. Uh, wheat berries are like one calorie per gram. You grind them up and they become two calories per gram. Remember, oil is nine calories per gram. Meat is four calories per gram. So, so they're a little more calorie dense. Well, would that have any practical implications? And a study was done at my alma mater, Michigan State University, uh, in a dormitory. It could have been my dormitory, Snyder Hall at Michigan State University. What they did is they asked 16 moderately overweight men of college age to add 12 slices of bread to their diet daily. They weren't asked to reduce anything. They could have as much bacon, many steaks, as many glasses of milk, and as many Coca-Colas or whatever they wanted. All they had to do was eat the 12 slices of bread a day. They had to do that. Well, when you eat the bread, you're eating food that is high carbohydrate, low fat. And you're displacing higher fat, low carbohydrate foods. That's what you're doing. The, the uh, average weight loss on the white bread was uh, uh, 14 pounds in 60 days, two months, spontaneously. Didn't even know that they that they were doing anything special. All they had to do was eat the bread. And if you ate brown bread, or less refined bread, it was 19 pounds. They spontaneously lost. Also dropped their cholesterol, triglycerides, and all bunch of other things you would expect. Uh, in the book, The Starch Solution, in the beginning, pages 24 and 25, uh, I think one of the more important books that uh, the McDougals have come out with, uh, you see something called The Starch Solution or The Starch Challenge. The Eat More Starch Challenge. And I put this in there to help the unconvinced. Uh, ask your friends and relatives to just do one of these things every day. Just, just one thing. Uh, like add four cups of steamed rice a day to your diet or four cups of boiled corn or four mashed potatoes. I'm saying or, not and. Or three cups of cooked beans, peas, and lentil, four cups of boiled spaghetti noodles or 12 slices of bread. And guess what will happen? You'll get the same results that these overweight college men got. 
you'll spontaneously lose the weight. You won't even know you were on a diet. But you have to eat this carbohydrate. High carbohydrate, low fat food. Worldwide, you see this, you see the picture worldwide of populations. We're talking about tens of thousands of years of history. We're talking about geography that extends the entire planet. What you find is people who live on high starch diets are trim and healthy. And that's most people who have lived on planet Earth. 99.99% .99 of the people who ever walked this planet lived on starch-based diets. That's what the science says. The old hunter-gatherer thing is just complete nonsense. No, people were gatherers, and they gathered corn and rice and beans and potatoes and on and on. The bulk of the calories from all large successful population of people throughout all of verifiable history come from starch. The Native American. I can show you research that 10, 12,000 years ago, they were living on something called four Cornish potatoes, which is where the four states come together in the Southwest. They lived on corn. What were the Aztecs and the Mayans referred to as? The people of the corn. If you go further south to the Andes, you find Incas lived on potatoes, except when they went to battle, then they switched to quinoa because it was lighter to carry. Africa, millet. Corn later on. Maize later on. Underground storage organs in these populations. How about in the breadbasket of the world? You know the breadbasket of the world is to turn on the news tonight. Iran, Iraq, Ukraine, Egypt. That's the breadbasket of the world. Why do they call that the breadbasket of the world? Because that's where people eat flour products, breads. Trim, healthy, hearty people. And then, of course, you go far east and you see the Asian populations. Uh, before 1980, there was virtually no obesity or type 2 diabetes in China. Before 1980, 90% of the diet of the Chinese people was from white rice. There are no fat people. No heart disease. No prostate cancer. No breast cancer. So the science is clear. The science proves that starches... Even bread are satisfying to hunger. Boy, that hunger is not going to let you alone. We, we've decided that, right? You, you can either make yourself nauseated and lose your appetite with low-carb diets, or you can take shots at, and pills that make you so sick you think you got bit by a Gila monster. Or you can eat starch. You know, Once you get the concept of starch in your mind, you get control. Everything makes sense. Uh, I get the complaint once in a while, the McDougal diet caused me to change, to gain weight. Don't work for me. Uh, it's pretty rare, but it does happen. I've got to have an answer for these people. Well, one thing is uh, they're coming in calorie deprived to the program. They're coming in having been on the low carb diets, having lost their six, eight, 10 pounds of glycogen and water. And when they start eating, they regain their glycogen. They gain weight. Or you have the overshoot phenomena. I mean, many of the people who come to that program have been suffering intermittently through dieting. They've been in pain. They remember the pain of hunger. And when finally food's available, we tell them, the more you eat, the trimmer and healthier you're going to be. Well, we unleash that food on people. Sometimes they overshoot like they did with Ansel Keys' study of starvation. But that corrects itself very quickly. You know, not, not, not when you're doing fat mass, but when your organs get their weight and strength back. You know, your liver and your muscles and your kidneys, and et cetera. That's, that's when you hit the trim body weight. You, tell you, you may gain weight on the McDougal. Really rare. But you may. A few of you. And that's why. Don't fret. It, it's just a matter, folks, of uh, something you can just open your eyes and see, huh? Can't you? You just you you see what happened to various populations of people who were once praised as trim people, 
particularly the Asians, the blacks, the people in uh, in India, or even the Middle East. Compare those to Americans or Europeans or people from Australia or New Zealand. So if we're going to fix the problem, I plain and simple, what we do is we change back to eating patterns of people who are trim and healthy. Well, that seems like a simple thing to understand, doesn't it? If you want to be one, you do one. You got to find one. And the Asian population is a high starch diet, so the people you want to find. So uh, you have the overshoot phenomena, and um, you have the problem of of uh, being glycogen depressed and regaining some extra weight when you go back to the program. That's why they write books that say 80 to 95 percent of the dieters regain their weight. Well, they do, but probably permanently when they follow other programs, but not on a starch-based diet. All right, so uh, what do you do? What do you do if you find yourself gaining weight? Well, be patient. Be patient. You'll lose the weight uh, if you need to. You know, thin people won't. But, uh, you know, you got to think about things uh, when you follow the diet. You gotta, first of all, you got to think about, are you really following the diet? <clears throat> it's really because we didn't teach it to you correctly enough, or maybe you weren't listening correctly enough. But, you know, you're not following the diet. That's the problem. I'll, I'll pretty much guarantee you. You're eating out. Uh, you think the McDougal diet is a diet of nuts and seeds and avocados. It's not, unless you want to gain weight. Alcohol. Alcohol is a big one. A lot of calories. A lot of a lot of inhibitions taken care of there. Yeah, those are the things you want to start thinking about. Uh, we've developed a couple of programs to make weight loss more efficient. And for those of you who want to hurry things up, or you need a little extra help, a different way of thinking about things. One is we have the Maximum Weight Loss Program. Maximum Weight Loss Program takes away flour products. Even though bread told you lose weight, well, we don't encourage bread bagels and pastas. Maybe pasta because it's kind of rehydrated with water is probably okay. But certainly not bread on the Maximum Weight Loss Program. No nuts, seeds, and avocados, of course. And you increase the amount of non-starch green and yellow vegetables. Okay, when you look at your plate, and really all you have to do is look at your plate. You don't need a dietetic handbook. You don't need a dietitian to go over it with you. Just look at your plate. You should see that 90% of the food on your plate is starch. Oh, that's, that's certainly by calories, but even by visual, you ought to at least see 70% of the plate is covered by starch. Let's just say 90%. At least 10% is green and yellow vegetables, non-starchy, like uh, celery and kale and broccoli and cauliflower. You know, those nutrient-dense foods, the ones that seem to never get you satisfied, that leave your stomach growling. You know those foods, nutrient-dense foods. Don't eat starches. Some of, the, some of these people say, don't eat starches. Yeah, well, you're never going to get permanent control if you don't eat starches. So we do that, encourage a little exercise and... Uh, um, cut the fruits to maybe one or none a day. Fruits are easy to take in calories. I mean, you love them and, and you know, they're so readily available. I'm good grief. Of course, don't eat dried fruits. So that's the maximum weight loss program. That's discussed to some extent. The maximum weight loss program also extends to one other concept, and that is monotony. Monotony. When, when people are introduced to new items, you know, new dishes, they eat more food as opposed to having the same old thing over and over again. So we developed something called Mary's Mini. Mary's Mini Diet. Mary's It's a diet. You're not supposed to be on it forever, which can be. Mary's Mini. And what it is, it's a, it's a starch you pick. You stay with the same starch. And you pick a couple of non-starchy green yellow vegetables. You eat this over and over and over and over again. You will lose weight faster. And, you know, it's not such a bad idea. I mean, think about it for a minute. Those populations we just talked about, you know, the people in, uh, in Central America, South America, or in times of the past, the American Indians, the Aztecs, the Mayans. I mean, think about it. Think about the Asians. Their, their diets are pretty much single-source starches. You know, potatoes from South America, corn from Central America, rice from Asia. They have... They have rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
you know, the statement for good morning in China is, have you had your rice today? That's how they greet each other. Monotony is okay. In fact, we encourage it, monotony. But we've got, we've got over 4,000 recipes published, so you can have a different recipe every day. Uh, one of the problems that we have is people lose too much weight. Now, I know, you think not, but it does happen on occasion, more than occasion. And so what I use is I use the Kemp, Kempner weight chart. This is from the rice diet. This is what Dr. Walter Kempner said you should weigh based on your height, fully dressed. And I put these in to reassure you that you're not losing too much weight. Okay? It's, it's, it's to make you realize that, you know, what you may consider normal is based on a population of old white people. That's who you're being compared with, not star cheaters. Anyway, if you take a look at the, uh, at the various heights and weights there, you can see where you fit in. And, and people who are sick, people who are, have diabetes and heart disease and so on, they need to be away even less, 10 to 15% fewer uh, pounds. Yeah. Anyway, this chart is mainly put there to reassure you. You're okay. So you are a star cheater, a star or a star cheaterian. Until you understand this, you will be out of control. Once you get this concept in your life, everything becomes easy. The truth is easy. It's easy to understand. And the truth don't change, folks. People have been eating starch-based diets for a long time. Anyway, if uh, we could be of some help to you, uh, we have a telemedicine program offer excellent medical care all the way through the program, the entire 12 days. We offer support. We have a support specialist that get up in the morning with you ask you what your blood sugar is, what your blood pressure, what your cholesterol might be, how you're feeling for the day, what are you going to have for breakfast, lunch and dinner, how are you going to deal with your friends when you go out to dinner, you know, how are you going to put up with this uh, complaining family member, et cetera. Support specialists spend all day with you. And we have an excellent education staff. We have uh, we have uh, Doug Lyle and Jeff Novick and Heather McDougall and Chef AJ. And good grief, we just have a whole bunch of talented people you already love. Jack Dixon for exercise. All done in the comfort of your home. Thank goodness for the internet. Anyway, you get in contact with us very easily. Uh, go to our website, drmcdougall.com, or give us a call. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how you fit into the program. We offer a, a little, little sample of the program, too. Our medical director will see you, not start treating you, but we'll see you You'll be charged, but that charge goes to the payment of the program if you decide to take it. So our medical director will sit down with you today, or maybe tomorrow, or maybe Monday. <laughs> so very shortly. I mean, you don't have to wait long and get everything worked out in terms of your medications and at least get started, uh, what you need to do, think about, eat, et cetera. And this may be a couple of months from your program, or a month anyways. <clears throat> but at least you get started when, when, when you have made the decision, and that's the best time. You know. All right. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. That was uh, that was a great presentation. So thank you for sharing all that information. So uh, we got about fourteen or so minutes left. So we'll do a, a brief Q and A um, for any audience members. If you have a question for Dr. McDougall, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom. The instructions are in chat. So um, you, you talked about something that was uh, that that well, actually uh, and real quickly. So you, you showed everybody how to get in contact with you. Um, if you want to get your books, they're also available on our bookstore. Um, the, they're purchased through Amazon, and the Real Truth by Health gets a little you know a little um, bit to help support what we do here. So just let people know. Okay. Um, so um, you, you spoke about Ozempic. Uh, you know, quite a yeah. bit. And it's obviously uh, quite popular. I, you know, I, I personally know a few people who, you know, all of a sudden they've lost weight. They've you've never seen them uh, that way before. And and you're like, wow, you look great. And they're, and they're proud. You know, it's not one of those things that they hide. They're like, oh my God, I'm on Ozempic. But what are the, and you mentioned some of the, the downsides. Uh, what are the dangerous symptoms for it? Because I'm hearing 
things about you know paralysis of the stomach and, and that type of thing. What yeah. what are what are things that might well, come let's, down let's, to like, let's, let's talk let's talk about the you know the the uh, slow gastric emptying. That's one of the sales pitches. You know that's the real doctors. That's the way they describe the benefits. Is the slows gastric emptying. But what that means is the food after you eat it stays in your stomach and it putrefies. And so one of the common complaints from people on these drugs is they have bad breath, horrible, stinking, lousy, rotten breath. Yeah, oh, there you're going to get that from stagnant food. And then what happens is the the food uh, you slow you slow the, the motility in the uh, small intestine and large intestine, and you can develop an ileus, which is where the intestine completely shuts down. I, you know, I, I have one contact where uh, the husband was telling me her, 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 his wife was in the hospital, almost died from an ileus, from this drug. So, you know, there's, there's the problem. Um, there are some very serious problems. There's some uh, uh, association with some thyroid disease and I listed a whole bunch of them. They're just a they're just a few people suffer from these particular problems. So I think the main thing is you just have to leave, live sick all the time. You know, you plan on you are going to suffer nausea and vomiting, uh, diarrhea, or stomach cramps, constipation, all kinds of distress from derivatives of a heel monster bite. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. And has I. I you mentioned that it was originally meant. It was originally meant for uh, for people with type two diabetes and and more severe symptoms. Has the population that is now using it for moderate weight loss has that ever been studied in any large scale uh, study? Well, the, the there, are, there are lots of papers coming out on weight loss, and they showed what I share, shared with you in the chart. They showed that uh, you know the control group loses a couple of percent because they're told to cut their calories back by 500 calories and to get some exercise. So the control group, the ones not getting the Ozempic, they lose, you know, three, four, five pounds. Okay, you know, 2% of their body weight. Uh, whereas the the people that are on the Ozempic, you know, I showed you how they have a nice percentage of weight loss as they lose their appetite, as they become nauseated, as they vomit. And that continues till they've lost maybe 12% of their body weight or 14%. Used to be 14% was what they would brag about, but now they're up to some drugs like Oigovi that uh, may result in a weight loss of 18, 20% of their body weight. But the thing you need to know is this all stops at 38 weeks, excuse me, 68 weeks. At 68 weeks, which is like a year and three months, you stop losing weight because the body says, hey, you keep this up, you're gonna die. And so we at least have to produce enough appetite for you to eat something. And so you've lost 38 pounds on average. That's it, 38 pounds on average. And now you can't lose any more weight, even when you take the drugs, only when you take the drugs. You still to take the drugs. But if you stop the drugs, you'll regain the weight. That's one of the things that pretty much everybody agrees on. So, uh, you know, I, I as, as far as people dropping dead from it, uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen too often. They spend a couple of years sick and draining their bank account. But when you can have so much more for nothing, just eat potatoes. Just, do, yeah. do the side I, I think I, pardon me? Uh, no, go ahead, finish your thought. No, you know, I, I, I really have a, a, a dilemma in my life is, you know, I see these people out there overweight, usually, because most of them just don't bother being hungry, it hurts too bad. And most of them can't stand the nausea from low carb diets and the constipation. And most of them can't afford these shots. So they're overweight and I, you know, I walk by them and I'll meet them and I'll talk to them. And I'll think about it and I'll say, well, good, if you just understood, you could have the same amount of weight loss in a year. We get about 23 pounds, they get 25 or you know, a couple of pounds difference. Same amount of weight loss without any of the side effects or costs. Costs nothing. Kind to the planet. Good to animals. You know, you don't lose your sex drive. You don't usually lose your muscle mass and bones. You also lose bone on these drugs. I, I you know, I listed like two pages of stuff, and all the research is very clear, very consistent. You're not going to find any disagreement. 
on what I shared with you in terms of results. So if somebody sat you down with that, uh, that two sheets of paper that I handed out to you, and you went point by point through it, and you said, well, you know, Aunt Margie, what do you think? Don't you think you ought to give this McDougal thing a try for a couple of days, a couple of weeks? You now we have people who, well, me as an example, have been eating this way for half a century. So it's not because we're consciously suffering and working at it. It's because these are the foods we love. Now, where I mentioned, you know, I get the Chinese restaurant syndrome when I used to eat the animal food diet, when I went to a Chinese restaurant. Now it's just the opposite. I, you know, I, it's been a long time since I've had it, but if I have anything off the diet in terms of animal foods, I don't notice the satisfaction and shouldn't based upon the research I showed you. Carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive, period. Protein does a little bit. Fat does nothing. This is why, why people can gain so much fat. You see, there's, there's no feedback. There, there's a, um, forgot the man's name. But anyway, one of the researchers uh, did experiments where he showed there's a, a feedback, like a thermostat in a warm room. Uh, when you eat fat, the body doesn't register that you've eaten it. So it keeps gaining and gaining and gaining and gaining. And we see people that are 600 pounds overweight. I've, I've seen some evening news stories where they had to come in with a forklift and pick people out of a bed. They weigh, they weigh, because there's no limit as to how much fat you can stuff in there because there's no feedback. But the body feedback feeds back with carbohydrate. Anyway. So uh, the, it, it may take a little study for you, but if you just stop and think about it, all large successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable history, including half the people, people of the world today live on starch-based diets. Get with it. Get over the suffering. Now, do all of the side effects go away when you stop the medication or do, is there a chance that some of them may persist uh. afterwards? I can't think of anything offhand permanent if you gain fat back. Okay. No, I, I mean, there are other, there are other minor conditions. I listed them on the slides. I haven't taken the trouble to memorize them. Thyroid conditions. And you know, I'll, I don't want to mention them because I, I can't remember in detail. They're about, about 10 slides back. So hopefully you'll watch this presentation more than once. Definitely will. So we had a speaker on earlier today. And as you know, we we invite all different you know perspectives here. Generally, you know people who are are, are plant positive, but um, the the speaker was talking about twelve items that you need to remove from your diet, and one of them he listed. And not to get you triggered here, but he he said potato skins. Is there anything <laughs> in potato skins? Is there any kind of potato skin that you know that has anything in it that yeah. you don't want to consume? Yes, I do. Okay. But, but potato skins aren't going to be any healthier for you or any unhealthier than the potato meal, than the white potato. Yeah, what will hurt you is something called solanine, which is a, a poison that develops when potatoes rot. Mm. They develop a green discoloration under the skin. And this uh, this solanine is, uh, causes a little nausea, a little fatigue. It never kills anybody. But spoiled potatoes have a green discoloration that occurs. So eat fresh potatoes. No, there's nothing wrong with potato skins. You don't have to eat them. There's where the, the uh, I thought you were going to ask is, do you have to eat the skins to get all the vitamins and nutrients? The answer is no, that's all. It's in the, it's in the, the white meat or the, the orange meat or whatever you're eating. And, and on your diet, what is the preferred uh, way of cooking potatoes? Or it might be easier to say, what are the ways not to cook potatoes? Obviously the most common way that people get potatoes in their diet is fried potatoes through French fries. I assume that that's not what you're talking about. So what are the, what are the ways, the cooking methods that you recommend? Well, of course, you're not going to add cheese to your potatoes. Well, that's where the potato got the bad reputation. It's the baked potato got a red bad reputation because of the company it keeps. It's the bacon, the sour cream, the butter, et cetera. You know, if you're going to add these things to it, you're going to change the benefits of your meal. The potato will still be there. It's still fighting for you. But it doesn't have much of a chance against bacon and cheese and sour cream. It just doesn't. So, um, yeah, 
I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I could extend this shortly by telling you that I can sh share with you. You can find them on my website. Two experiments where they raised potato people on potatoes alone. One instance was six months, a man and a woman, and another was for a year and a half. Perfect health. Had no desire to get off the potatoes. They were happy eating just potatoes. So the name of the researcher who did the one on the couple is Khan. Look up Khan and All Potato Diet. It was published in 1928. All You'll right. find it. It's available free on the internet. Great. K-O-N. I'm sure many of our uh, participants will be checking that out. So uh, I want to just, we've got two minutes left. I'm just going to throw it out to the audience for a quick question. Um, Janet M., uh, please state where you're from and ask your question. Um, hi, Dr. McDougal. I'm from Maryland, and I just wanted to thank you so much for all the wonderful work you've done over the years. I've followed some of your work and really appreciate you and all your great work. Um, my question is, um, in the slide about the maximum weight loss, um, you had that uh, one can eat 8 to 14 times a day. So I was just wondering oh, if yeah. you could expand on that. Uh, yeah. So does that mean yes. eating every hour, every two hours? And does that speed you, you up choose. weight? Okay. You choose. It, it, it's based on experiments where they compare uh, gorgers uh, with nibblers and grazers. You know, a gorger will eat once a day or twice a day or three times a day. Whereas a nibbler or grazer will eat 14 times a day. You can pick whatever you want. What happens is, when you gorge, there are times between meals which your body has to resort to food storage because you're not eating. So all the, uh, the enzymes, et cetera, that go to uh, putting fat into your fat cells and making whatever conversion they have to make, all that takes place during that period of not eating. If you're going to gorge once a day, twice a day, you're going to eat, et cetera. When you nibble, you never have to resort to the storage metabolism. You're eating all the time. You're always got a carbohydrate with you. The other thing has to do with insulin. Uh, you, If you measure the, the area under the curve with gorgers versus nibblers, as far as the insulin produced, you produce much less insulin when you nibble or graze. Insulin drives fat into fat cells. So, you, you know, you choose what you want. It's just I'm trying to give... An example from one or two meals a day to fourteen to twenty a day. It doesn't matter. You pick. It's it's a it's a it's helpful. Then you don't have to be hungry. Just eat. Or I would encourage just, when you're hungry, eat. It's there's there's nothing wrong with you. You know, you, to take the attitude as a doctor when they meet you that you're a genetic defect or a psychological disaster. How much help can they give you? And they've already condemned you to it being your fault. When I look at you, I look at a thin, healthy person just following the wrong rules. And we'll bring that health and the good looks out in a very short period of time. So, you know, yeah. Thank you so much. So we're out of time now. Uh, for for uh, our guest, uh, Dr. McDougall will be on our second panel of the evening at 815. So if you have any questions, you can you can join us at that time. Um, so thank you so much for all the information. I look forward to talking with you in an hour and 15 minutes. Um, if we could unmute the audience so they can share their appreciation for Dr. McDougal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.